Hi, I'm Jude from HeadFi.org, and on this episode of HeadFi TV, we have a very special guest. We have Paul Barton. You guys are probably more familiar with Paul's products, especially his headphone products. This is the NAD Viso HP50. This is the, I think that's the M4U1 uh, from PSB. So I think a lot of head fires are familiar with the headphones, but they might not necessarily be familiar with the man behind the headphones. So I wanted to introduce Paul Barton from PSB. Hi, Jude. Good to see you again, yeah, good Paul. Good to see you. So I want to first start by asking you, Paul, um, can you just first start by telling us something about yourself? I don't think a lot of people on HeadFi necessarily know who you are or much about you. Well, PSB is founded in loudspeakers mainly. Um, a Canadian company that I started in 1972. So this is my 43rd year designing acoustic products. And I say acoustic products because we're now doing headphones. Right. And um, the Canadian loudspeaker industry has been well known internationally for the uh, value that we can offer consumers in loudspeakers. And um, it has a lot to do with uh, a facility in Canada called the National Research Council, uh, NRC, better known as. And what NRC is, is it's, a, it's like a university campus that employs about 1,000 PhDs in all of the sciences. Um, you've probably seen, uh, you know, this, the, the, the Canada arm that's on the space shuttle? Right. Well, that was developed at the National Research Council in Ottawa in conjunction with SPAR Aerospace, a Canadian company. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the NRC, there is an acoustics division, which I approached in 1974. Uh, at the time, uh, one of the professors there or doctors there was Dr. Floyd Toole, who um, eventually went on to write many papers about the relationship between subjective and, and objective measurements of loudspeakers, uh, the, 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 fun, the foundation on which I do all of my loudspeaker development, and uh, hence has transposed into the approach that we take in designing headphones, um, something we call room feel. And uh, room feel is, a um, well, when you listen to a pair of loudspeakers uh, in a room, that's the, that's that is how music is, is recorded and how, how it's intended to be played back. But people who listen to headphones typically listen to music that isn't in a room. The, uh, so when you have a loudspeaker in a room, the room has some effect on the, on the performance of the, the musical event that you're listening to. And if you don't include that modification in playing back on a headphone, you're not going to hear the music the way the musician intended. So we call this room feel. And it, it's a specific target function which over time has been developed at the National Research Council. Um, we did a study at the end of uh, the 80s, early 90s, which was an attempt to design um, a speaker, a smart speaker, one that could adapt to the, to the environment. And after doing a lot of subjective evaluations with people on what the best sound was when you equalized the speaker in a room, we came up with a target function that people like the sound of when they listen to it in a room. With loudspeakers? Yes. And uh, so, so there's, there are, by now, established standards with respect to, or an understanding uh, about people's preferences relative to the measurements with loudspeakers? Well, yes. Uh, this body of work that is probably the largest body of work ever done on the subject of correlating or evaluating loudspeakers, uh, what we have found is that there is a relationship between measurement and people's preferences. Um, just to give you a, a, sum, a summary of what the results of these tests were, um, most of the people most of the time agreed on the relative qualities of a group of speakers or or the, the, they agreed on the sound that they were looking for, uh, which is always a good thing because that's what a speaker should be. It should be a window through which you see the musical event. It shouldn't have tint like, you know, when you put sunglasses on that make everything look brighter. Right. Well, that's, that's fine. And if you like doing that, then you can turn the tweeter or treble up. But our goal is to be transparent and um, 
a system in a room needs to be as transparent as possible. The second thing that we've learned is that musical taste and musical experience are no prerequisites for being a good judge of sound. You can, you know, no one has a tin ear unless they have some hearing impairment. So uh, I think uh, this gets rid of a lot of fallacies about personal taste in sound. There really isn't one. If, you, if, if, the, if the person is asked what to you sounds the most natural, all of us will give the same answer. And we've pretty much shown that. The third thing that we've learned is that a properly interpreted set of objective measurements of a loudspeaker correlates directly with listener preferences. So having known that, uh, it's sort of a good scientific approach. It's turned what used to be kind of a black art in loudspeakers into a science. One of the things that I've noticed though, being in the headphone business, is it sort of reminds me of what it was like in the early days of loudspeakers where they all had their own very strong personalities and very often were marketed on the basis of East Coast sound, West Coast sound, acoustic suspension, bass reflex, on all of those attributes where they all had their own, seemed their own personalities, it turns out that's not what it should be. And I think headphones, to some degree, are in that mode right now and need some kind of standards. Uh, and we've spoken earlier about some of the research that I've been doing on developing a better measurement system for headphones that gives us much more accurate measurements up to higher frequencies, which is always a challenge when it comes to evaluating headphones. Traditionally, uh, headphone or uh, measurements of the human ear have been really based on science that was required to make good hearing aids for people when they had hearing loss. Uh, there hasn't been, in, at least in the public domain, very much work done on hi-fi or high-resolution audio in terms of the measurement systems that are, in, uh, are, are, are available and are used. Uh, we have one measurement system here today, which is a typical system developed for making uh, competent measurements, but it has limitations because it isn't founded on the basis of uh, hi-fi. It's been founded on the basis of uh, more medicine or, or uh, hearing, uh, hearing aid development. Although, it, you know, this particular device is one of the better ones and simpler ones to use. Uh, they call this the uh, ear and cheek simulator uh, with a, a, a real pinna and a clamp that can be adjusted for the clamping force. So this is the kind of setup that we use to do uh, the actual measurements. And of course, uh, the database of headphones and measurements is you know, something I'm just sort of getting into. And uh, by adding this room uh, effect into the response of the headphone, because you've got to think about this for a minute, most people who listen to music on headphones are listening to music that was recorded to be played back on speakers in a room. So that's part of why the speaker, or that's what the, the producers and, and the musicians who are recording music, they know that when they listen to their recordings, they're going to listen to them, and so are the consumers, on a pair of speakers in a room. And even today, which you can actually do room EQ and do all kinds of compensation, but in the earlier days where most music has been recorded, um, there was no processing between the, the source and the speaker to make the speaker adapted to the room, so you sort of had to live with the fact that those speakers are going to end up in a normal room and they got to sound good, so let's make the recording so that it sounds good in a room, and that's what, that's what essentially happened but you don't have the room with headphones, so we've actually put the room into the headphones. Uh, so now, Paul, I just want to step back for a second to talk about something that uh, you mentioned earlier. You mentioned that there, uh, with the measurements of speakers, you can make uh, some determination. We can predict. You can predict what the, uh, personal speakers. preferences yeah. uh, uh, would be, but that doesn't necessarily exist right now with headphones. No. Um, some work has been done uh, by the Harmon Group uh, under the direction of Sean Olive. Um, <clears throat> Sean used to work at the National Research Council in Ottawa and uh, joined Harmon along, or just shortly after Floyd Toole uh, joined Harmon from the National Research Council in Ottawa 
to uh, you know head up their engineering department and uh, Sean has now done I think about four papers on the subject trying to do what Floyd did back in the early 70s into the 80s uh, where he you know basically looked at the relationship between measurements and p listener preferences and trying to correlate those two together well that really hasn't been done with headphones specifically and the methodology that they used or that was used back in the, the early days with loudspeakers which I applied um, I applied to the headphones that were uh, producing now on top of that <clears throat> I've added this room feel that we that I mentioned and that is that's part of the equation in making a headphone sound with music that was recorded to be played back all right. So just I, I want to make sure that, you know, that, that, that people understand kind of what we're talking about here, because obviously you work around all this. I'm rather familiar, certainly not on your level with with what you're doing and the preferences and the measurements. So now let's just to make it clearer, uh, let, let's let's talk about those preferences and measurements with loudspeakers so that we can come up with some relative um, understanding. So mm -hmm. now let's say let's talk about the loudspeaker. If we go into a room mm -hmm. or an anechoic chamber or whatever you want to go into, we, 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 from the listening position or the measuring position, mm -hmm. we calibrate it. We, uh, uh, get it so that it's flat, mm -hmm. right? Right. Let's just say <clears throat> hypothetically, we do it flat from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz and you have a perfectly flat measured response. Yeah. Would that correlate with what people want? No. Okay. So now that's an interesting, that's that's what I wanted to establish. So so if we calibrate it flat from 20 to 20, what would it sound like for most people? So now you have a microphone, it's measuring it perfectly flat. What would the preference tend to be there? I mean, what would the... What... The, the subjective judgments, uh, when a listener doesn't know what they're listening to, they're just making judgments on the sound that's being reproduced. Right. They would describe a flat frequency response in a room as being... Uh, lack bass. It would lack bass, and it would be thin sounding. So if we so in a room, right? If we did a room corrected flat twenty to twenty, right? That would be considered uh, thin. It would be yeah. It, people would say not enough bass. Okay. Or some other people may describe it from the other perspective and say that it sounds thin. Okay, because before we get into room sound or room gain, as it applies to the headphones, because right. I want to make sure it's understood why you're doing okay. that or why do so so now let's talk about like for example with bass frequencies as we talked about earlier being more omnidirectional right. when you have a direct radiating loudspeaker which is a typical speaker that right. people use it's got a woofer a mid-range right. a tweeter or it's a two-way well not a not a dipole so just no a, just a, a standard direct radiating right, right, loudspeaker right, right, right. Okay. um and and believe me that's the format that most recordings are sure. used to make a recording. Sure. Okay. Um, and and it, yeah. And even in live concerts, that's the yeah. direct radiators. Yeah. The, the, so what happens is at low frequencies, the speaker is omnidirectional. The energy is equal all the way around the speaker. But as the frequencies get higher, the directionality gets narrower and narrower. So when you're in a room, Part of the sound you hear comes directly from the loudspeaker, and part of the sound bounces off the walls. Well, if there's no energy at high frequencies, not much of it's going to bounce off the wall. Right. But if there's more energy, if it's omnidirectional at low frequencies, low frequencies are going to bounce. So, the energy that we, the, when, the description of the energy that's created around a loudspeaker, we call the sound power. It's the total energy the speaker is putting out over the, its operating range. The sound power has, a, if this is low frequency and this is high frequency, the sound power typically has a tilt. And in, in terms of measurements and evaluations, the uh, rate of that tilt and any fluctuations in that dips or, or uh, hollows or tells you that the directivity is not constant coming out of the speaker. Right. Um, so part of what you hear is the direct sound and part of what you hear is the sound power. If you were to measure that in a room, the, the sound you're listening to actually has a tilt on it. That's what we call the room gain or the room effect. And that's what you need to apply to a headphone because the room isn't there. And the music that was recorded was intended to be played back 
with that correction or with that room effect in it. Right. So it makes a lot of sense to put that EQ into the headphone. And we do it both passively and actively with our noise cancelling headphone or just a passive headphone. All right. So it's just a matter of how you've tailored the sound. And it seems to be um, getting a lot of positive reaction because people actually like the way the speakers, uh, the headphones sound. You mentioned uh, Sean Olive and his and the studies they're doing. Yes. Uh, and uh, from my understanding, I mean, I've read them. Uh, uh, it seems to be also kind of consistent. Well, it, it's yeah, sort with, of, with, it's what, sort with of, what he's starting sort of, to find. Yeah, right? it sort of validates the yeah. approach that that I've taken, and and it makes a lot of sense because we come from the same camp, right? So to speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but, but, but his studies are showing that to be... Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's showing, uh, he's just confirming the, the subject that we're, we're talking about. And, right. And maybe, maybe even has, has the uh, plans to even further, take this even further. Yeah, I kind of got that impression yeah. that there was still more to oh, be done. Oh, there's more to be done. Yeah. And, and I, 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 well, one of the things that needs to be done is being able to do better measurements. And we've spoken earlier about some of the experiments that I've done. We've done some research on it. Um, you, you kind of found it humorous the, the, when we spoke about it. That is, uh, what we've done is taken um, scans of uh, ear canals from human cadavers. Yeah, that that just to be clear, that in and itself wasn't. <laughs> Well, wasn't that, 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 that in itself wasn't funny. It's a, it's yeah, a, yeah. I, I, forget it. I won't even anyway. get into it. It was a discussion we so had earlier. That's neither here nor there. Yeah. Anyway, we've done a, we've done a, a, a an, an initial experiment because w w what the attempts were, and maybe I'll give you a little bit of historical background. Um, at the National Research Council, when I approached it in 1974, there was be, there was work being done by Dr. Edgar Shaw. That he was Floyd's. Uh, director of that division. Right. So uh, he, was, he was Dr. Toole's boss. So. Sort of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, uh, he was actually mapping the external pinna. And uh, if you go through the, the historical uh, work that's been done on the human, human hearing and human ear, uh, a lot of the work that Edgar Shaw, he published most of his stuff in the Acoustical Society of America uh, periodicals and d presented all his papers there. And um, a lot of the periodicals and, and the history cite his work on the external ear. Well, uh, a lot of the, just so you know, a lot of the, the uh, hardware and a lot of the results of those uh, experiments and the knowledge that was gained by those things uh, was available to me when I decided that we, we were going to do headphones or that when PSB decided that we were going to do headphones. And, uh, taken a lot of sort of hit the ground running so to speak when it came to everything that we've done in headphones and um, understanding what the what the pinna does and and the ear canal one of the things that I discovered fairly quickly was that the bandwidth uh, over which you can get reliable measurements is somewhat limited uh, based on the equipment and the historical information that's been done on because most of this work was done for the purpose of hearing aids. All right, so, so based on current technology, I want to talk about that. Yeah. So based on the current methods, right. uh, even in a best case scenario, would you say the bandwidth would be more limited relative to uh, 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 the, the, the frequency range that we're talking about with hi-fi gear? Well, you know, we like to talk about 20 to 20 kilohertz. Right. And uh, I don't feel you get reliable results above about eight kilohertz okay. with the current measurement systems. Like the coupler that's in this, your in cheek uh, really is limited up to up to about eight kilohertz, and beyond that, the the measurement isn't representative, or the impedance of it isn't representative of a human ear canal up to twenty kilohertz. Very difficult to do, and that's one of the things that this experiment that I'm talking about is an, is attempting to do. And the big challenge is to try and get um, uh, the the ear coupler to match the impedance of the eardrum up to 20 kilohertz. How close are you getting so far? Well, the first experiment showed good promise. Uh, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, what we're going to do um, is there are available 14 ear canal scans. So we're going to build all 14 of them, create sort of a, an average 
between them all and see if in fact we can make a better measurement machine, so to speak, so that the coupler that's in here can go up to reliably, and we think it'll be reliable up to about 14 kilohertz. Okay. So that's kind of where we're going with the research, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite excited about it. It's sort I am of, too. It, it's sort of uh, re reminding me of the good old days when I first started in loudspeakers, so it's, it's kind of being, re for me, a, re a rebirth of all this excitement that I had when I was much younger. Right. <laughs> well, no, it's, that's, and in 14 is a heck of a lot better than 8. If you can have Absolutely. some very meaningful data above, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a know, lot of information in music around 14 kilohertz. Oh yeah, so, so. between eight and 14. Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah, so that would be exciting. Yeah, uh, to have that and to have that be uh, representative of you know to actually be able to look at it, and make a determination the way you're doing with loudspeakers right. comfortably, yeah. uh, relative to preference. And, well, be able to correlate that with listener preference. Right, right, right. All right. Well, so now now let's get <clears> back <throat> to the headphones. Because you talked about, so let, I just want to try to summarize uh, in layman's terms so that just to make sure that I understand it and other people understand it. Um, uh, the lower you go in frequency with loudspeakers, uh, or in general, uh, the more omnidirectional the frequencies, I mean, the, 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 the sound. I think a lot of people understand that. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then the higher you go, the more directional it becomes. Mm -hmm. Because of that, in a room, you have more energy. Or, uh, you experience uh, more low end. More you experience more low end because there's more reflected energy yeah. uh, coming from the low from frequencies. A, from a flat loudspeaker. Right, okay. right, right. So, so now, given the, that it's through these types of loudspeakers that most recordings are made for, you are attempting to recreate that that room gain mm -hmm. in the way you're tuning the headphones. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's really in a simple way. That's exactly what we're doing. And that's what you've done with, uh, so just so you know, in case you're not familiar, the three headphones, it's three right now, right? right. The, the, again, the NAD. Well, actually four. Wait, which one? Is NAD it? has an in-ear one as well called the HP20. Oh, I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the, v and, and you did it for that as well, yes. I would have to imagine. Yeah. So this is the Viso HP50. There's an HP20, which I, I haven't heard. And then the M4U1 and the M4U2 by PSB. Um, uh, so if you like that sound, and a lot of the critics have really... Uh, uh, given a lot of plaudits, really, to to all of your headphones, really. Yeah, they've cited that 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 the approach we've taken seems to be widely accepted. Yeah. Yes. So, and then, and again, the, some of the studies that we're seeing come out, I think, are yeah, it's just supporting you. Yeah, kind of confirming. It. So, so well, that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then the measurement advances are going to be cool. When when can we? When do you think? I are would... you willing to say that we'd be seeing some of the advances in the headphone measurements? Um, uh, I'm hoping. You know, uh, certainly by the end of next year. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it'll take some time. I mean, I've got to do some product development in the same... So, uh, hopefully by the end of 2015. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm hoping to maybe even write some uh, journal papers on the subject. Oh, that'd be exciting. Yeah. Would it be under the NRC? Uh, sort well, of maybe I would submit it to the AES. Okay. okay. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, that's exciting. And... Um, uh, if you haven't heard uh, the NAD uh, headphone, uh, the PSB headphones, there certainly is a familial sound. I mean, there's really no getting around the fact that, mm -hmm. uh, that he tuned them both. So that's um, uh, something, if you haven't heard them, you really should. So with all, with all the things that we're talking about here, the measurements, um, uh, the room gain that you're putting into your headphones, this is determining how you tune them. Um, what else do you have coming down the pike? I mean, we have, so so far, for those of you not familiar, uh, we have the uh, PSB M4U1 and M4U2 headphones and the NAD Viso uh, HP50 right. and then the HP20 in-ear. Right. Um, I haven't heard the HP20 yet, but uh, uh, if you listen to these three headphones and apparently the HP20 as well, there's no denying that these were tuned by Paul Bart. I mean, when you listen to them, these were... They're of a family. Yeah. Um, they have a DNA. There's a DNA uh, that goes across them all. Uh, so what 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 what's going forward? What do you have coming down the pike? Well, we're, we don't really have any plans to go down market. Okay. With uh, with our offerings, so obviously that's the same the same thing as I'm planning. We're planning to go up market. Right. And uh, one of the things that I won't get into too much detail, but sure. one of the things that I find and I'm sure all your readers uh, or viewers find, um, is that 
When you put a pair of headphones on, unless it's a binaural recording, for the most part, the sound is in the middle of your head. Right. And there's always people, there, there are people that are attempting to try and get the sound outside the head. And this is something with new technology and uh, new studies that are starting to uh, surface on uh, ways in which, with technology, we can teach ourselves to actually move the sound outside the head. And I think that's really the challenge for any headphone future sure. technology. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, oh, it's absolutely. Yeah, this is a conversation I think that, uh, a lot of that I have with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and I, I, I truly believe that's really the next frontier that we really have to overcome. And that doesn't mean specific products, but it's a matter of technology and techniques. And I think just to give a hint, I think it's something, you know, I guess you could do it. Smythe, I think, do some of these yeah, things. Yeah, 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 the, the realizer. Yeah, and, and uh, but that's kind of complicated, and it has to be specific to the end user. And I think there are ways in which, if you do it properly, you can teach people how to do that, which is kind of the approach I think needs, needs to happen. So anyway, that's just what's going oh, up. Oh, is that a hint? Well, you mentioned now that you're not likely to go down market, no. uh, might we see in the future uh, something more akin to a flagship? Absolutely. Oh, okay, it's absolutely. You and heard it, it here. And it, it may have features that help you to get the sound outside your head. It, it may have features. <laughs> a flagship from Paul Barton. So, so that this could be that could be exciting. Yeah. Um, I hope that happens. Um, so do I. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna hold you to it now. Okay. Uh, but uh, but uh, so we're talking kind of more. I mean, I, I mean, within reason, cost no object type approach. I think uh, still affordable though. Still affordable. Yeah. All right. Not crazy. Hard to determine what's affordable with the head fi spectrum of things. But, well, that's uh, true. I yeah. mean, uh, very much in the PSB tradition. Okay. We're, we're just introducing a new flagship right now, which your loudspeaker. Yeah. Okay. Which which uh, is called the Imagine T3, and you know, for a lot of people, seventy five hundred dollars a pair is a lot of money, and for many people, it's not. In the loudspeaker world and hi-fi, so on HeadFi, I'm not sure how many people are looking at the high-end hi-fi world, 7,500 for a flagship. That would actually constitute your most expensive loudspeaker. That's right. Um, uh, but in the hi-fi world, that would be considered, that's, well, that's actually, the, that's mid-priced. In, in the, the high-end yeah. world where you're looking at, you know, something like a Magico at oh, yeah. 100 grand yeah, or yeah, 150 yeah, yeah. grand right. a pair, uh, yeah, it's relatively inexpensive. But for, you know, PSB, has one uh, attribute, I think, that, or we think we have one attribute that uh, people recognize, and that is we really go for value at any price point. Right. So we won't do it, and I won't throw money at things that aren't real. Uh, you may find that a lot of companies, especially in the luxury side of things, will just simply do it because they can, not because it's got, add, add, because it adds any value. To the product. Gotcha. We're kind of the other the other way. Well, even independent of what you're saying, I think the reviews on your loudspeakers have kind of borne that out in terms of value. Yeah. You you seem to win a lot of uh, uh, accolades with respect to value yeah. for the buck. And um, and th that is our intention. You know that, that that is the reason PSB has the reputation is because we go for that. Right. So Absolutely. so. Uh, yeah, so a, a, a version, you know, a flagship headphone from you would be? Would be good value, but it doesn't necessarily mean it'll be inexpensive. Okay, good. Yeah. No, that would be exciting to see. Now, you, But obviously you're not, I don't think he's going to give up too much in the way of details yet. But you know that we're going to sit him down again when it's time. Well, uh, yeah, I'll be calling you when it's yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? You're going to visit again? <laughs> yeah, yeah let's do it. Or I'll come up and see you at NRC. Yeah, that's what now, you Now, that know, would be fun. That's what you need to do. All right. Bring, I'd like to do that. Bring your camera crew and everything. You got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, that is Paul Barton from PSB. And again, he does acoustic engineering also for Blue Sound uh, and for NAD. Um, so I'm really excited that you're, you know, I've, you and I, I mean, I've met you a while ago, but you're one of the guys in the audio industry that I absolutely wanted to meet. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm so really I'm excited. glad to meet you. Likewise. Thanks man. a lot. Thanks, Paul. Okay.